All right, so we are off to another evening of study. We've had some really crazy, uh, crazy weather here in Northwest Missouri. It's kind of cool and rainy right now. Almost uh, like normal fall-like weather. A few days ago, we had tornadoes popping around the area. So wild and crazy times that we're living in. I just... <laughs> You know, some people look at this and say, well, there's an end time sign. Well, I remember tornadoes and wild and crazy weather ever since I was a kid. So maybe the generation fits, but there's some other signs. And that's what we want to look at this evening as we continue to study <clears throat> bits and pieces of Matthew chapter 24 and, and other locations. But I thought, it, I thought you would find this uh, not only interesting, but uh, probably a point of prayer for the day and age we live. We all know that we're living in, let me rephrase that. I, I'm not sure that we all do understand that we're living in the last days. And I'm going to be sharing some bits and pieces of a poll in a few minutes that uh, kind of reflects that. But you're listening, and that's what's, that's what's important. And you probably understand that we're living in the last of the last of the last days, as some would say at the last few seconds of the last minute of the last hour, of the last days of this age. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 24, and we're also going to be in Revelation chapter 2. So you might get your Bible handy and get ready to go there. In the meantime, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we study this evening. It's important that we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. To, uh, to dig out the nuggets from the text and apply them to our life the way the Lord wants them to be applied to our life in these days. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are so thankful that you have loved us so much that you sent your son to die for our sins. And he rose again on the third day to give us life, to give evidence that everything he said is true, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we have our salvation only because he died for our sins. And we believe in him. And he ascended to heaven, and he awaits that day, the appointed time when he comes for the bride, his people. We await that day too. So we pray for help by your Holy Spirit this evening as we study the word of god we want to dig out what is there so that it can be applied to our life and we can grow spiritually in maturity and grow closer to you in loyalty and in love so help us with that we pray in jesus name amen well last week we looked at the parable of the 10 virgins. I, I hope you found that interesting. If you did watch it, if you didn't go back and watch that, I think the key to that parable more than anything else is to be ready. We can draw lots of parallels probably from it, about being full of the Holy Spirit, being, you know, being, being watchful for the King to come, but all 10 of them were watching for the King to come. And, and we're waiting for the bridegroom, and yet five of them really weren't ready. And so that was the parable last week of the ten virgins. Today, though, we're not going to look at a parable. We're going to look at something that the Lord says that is um, rather startling when you think about it. So let's go there, Matthew chapter 24, and we are studying... Uh, beginning at, let's say, verse 9. Once again, I understand that Matthew chapter 24, I hope you understand too, but I'm sure going, I always get comments in my, uh, in, the, in the comment section of my YouTube channel where this also goes up of uh, kind of a supposed correction that Matthew chapter 24 is not talking to the church, it's talking to Israel. Well, yes, I understand that. I understand it completely, but there are parts of Matthew chapter 24 that are obviously for the church and obviously for the disciples and obviously for every believer. And, and some of those include the signs of the times of the end. It affects all of us. The, the signs of the times don't just affect Israel and they won't just affect the fig tree. They will affect the whole world. 
and we in the church are watching and waiting and longing for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's a crown that waits, the crown of righteousness awaits those who are longing for the appearing of Christ. And so watching, we see the signs, we see the signs in action, we see the signs in multiplication, we see the signs growing in intensity, like the labor pains that come upon a woman until the baby is born, we see all of that happening, including what I'm going to read tonight. So Verse number nine, chapter 24, Matthew, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now that's kind of something that's for, of course, many of the disciples who were listening died. They were killed for their faith in Jesus Christ, but many over the generations have been killed. And even in this current uh, age, uh, this current generation, even to this current year, to this We've seen it happening that believers have been slaughtered, happening even now in Afghanistan and other areas like Afghanistan, uh, Myanmar. Many believers have died this year, been martyred. So this goes for the church. Verse 10, and many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. So we're seeing, we're seeing hatred. We're seeing hatred for one another. We're seeing hatred in the society. Then comes this verse, the next two verses, then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Uh, man, I don't even need to talk about that. There are so many false prophets who are prophesying all kinds of things right now. They're deceiving many people into believing that this is all going to get better. This is all going to turn into the millennium that we're, we're going to take over the world. We're going to have a conquest of the world by the church. It's going to be the great revival, the great awakening, all of those words that are used. I understand the sentiment. We all want things to get better, but we're in the prophetic, as Brother Chooch from thinking out loud about the end times, TOL end times says, we're in the bang zone. He coined a phrase called the rapture bang zone. We're in the bang zone. So many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Verse 12, and here's the one I want to talk about this evening. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he endures until the end will be saved. Okay, let's let's talk about this. Broken down the words here. First of all, lawlessness. I've had I've had many comment and say, well, this is um, this is a, a proof text. I, although they don't use that word, I just use that word that this is a text that says we need to be obeying the law, and lawlessness is when you break the law of Moses. Well, I beg to differ. That's not what this word means. It's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the transgression of the law as if we as believers in Jesus Christ also have to follow the, the law of Moses and follow the system and the law of Moses. That would mean we would need to be Jews in practice, and believers in Christ in spirit, and um, and and that has that is not what it's saying. In fact, we know that we have no we we can't have salvation. We do not have salvation because of the law. We do not have salvation in obeying the law. We have salvation in faith in Jesus Christ by faith in Jesus Christ alone and His sacrifice, and we obey the commands of Christ. The commands of Christ are very simple. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. When you do that, you have the whole law in a nutshell, those two. So it's not individual pieces of a law that we follow or, you know, uh, worship on Saturday and not Sunday, Uh, not understanding that Jesus fulfilled the law, that Jesus is the Sabbath, whether we worship Jesus all the time, things like that. That life, The fact that we love Jesus and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, of course we're not going to murder. Of course we're not going to take the the, the life of an unborn baby. Of course we're not going to do all all of that because we're in Christ, all right? This word, however, 
is is uh, uh, the word anomia in the Greek. And the word anomia means several things. First of all, it means iniquity, knowing what's right and doing the wrong thing anyway. That's what iniquity means. When you see sins and iniquities, sins are transgressions of law. Iniquity is knowing what's right and doing it, doing the wrong thing. Knowing what's wrong and doing it anyway is another way to put it. Uh, it means unrighteousness. It means uh, having known the way of righteousness and yet doing unrighteousness. It means knowing and understanding what is wicked and yet doing wickedness at the same time. Now, we see wickedness. We see transgression. We see sin abounding. We see this taking place. And by the way, the word abound, pethuno, plethuno, it's kind of where we get the word plethora from, a plethora of sin, a plethora of wickedness, a plethora of unrighteousness. Makes it sound pretty, but it's not. It's disgusting and it's evil. And it is understanding what is evil and doing it to the point that evil becomes normal. Days of Noah, ding, 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 ring the bell. <laughs> We've talked about as in the days of Noah, so what shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man? What was it in the days of Noah? Wickedness was always on their mind. Every thought was evil all the time, and that became their normal. And in their normal, they ate, drank, gave in marriage, and married. It became normal. So wickedness was normal until the day that Noah and his family were shut up in the ark, and seven days later it began to rain, and the floods were opened up on the earth. So the plethora here is not a pretty thing. It's just absolute and total wickedness is, is in this uh, abounding stage, and the word uh, plethuno means to multiply slash abound slash swell. Now hold that thought. Because of the increase of this lawlessness, this wickedness, this knowing what is wrong and doing it anyway, to the point where it becomes normal and where it swells and everything is normal being wicked, because of that, the love, it says, of many will grow cold. So Jesus is talking about the love of many will grow cold. And I believe, listen to this, I'm not sure we're talking just about the world. I, the way I read this passage, the way I see this, and he, that he is talking to his disciples, he's talking to the Jews, he's talking even to the church in many instances here, that he's talking about those who know the way of truth, and yet they are allowing their lives to swell with, pardon me, with unrighteousness, with wickedness, with iniquity, to the point where is it possible that their consciences, the Spirit of God has been speaking to, to their conscience, and their conscience is seared, and they no longer sense and feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, even though He is screaming out within them, And so this is a very sad state of affair when you look at this. But it's not just the sin and the wickedness here. Understand that the love, that's the word agape, it's that uh, literally the, the, the warm sensation of brotherly love that comes from deep within that is associated with love for God. The love that deep love for God, for many, because of the swelling, the abounding of unrighteousness. See how it's all connected together? The, that warm depth of love for God will grow cold. Now, the word grow cold here is an interesting word because it, it means... Uh, it means it will grow, it will, it will be so chilled and so slow chilled. It's going to be a slow chill, but the picture is of flame out. It's where uh, a flame that was white hot 
uh, slowly because of the atmosphere of cold slowly flames out and it, it's gone. The flame dies out. The love of most will flame out. It will grow cold. Wow. I, I don't know if you get the impact of that. It says a couple things to me. It says, first of all, that I need to, to stay in check. I always need to be looking at my heart, and you do too. We need to constantly be looking at our heart. Am I, am I allowing attitudes and actions in my life that, that fit this description of knowing that it's wrong and doing it anyway? Am I, am I allowing that attitude? Am I allowing attitudes that I know I should not have, but allowing them to remain rather than presenting them to the Lord, asking for his forgiveness and for his cleansing of that unrighteousness, and then repenting of it, turning and doing something else, changing my mind, doing differently when it comes to that attitude or that action. Are you doing that? I, I think it's uh, in these days, we're, we're finding that it is so absolutely necessary to check our hearts, to check our attitudes, to check and even be in relationships where someone else, often called accountability partnerships or accountability relationships, where someone has the, the right that, that um, because of mutual love and brotherhood to come to us and say, hey, Jackson, this is just this attitude that you're showing is just not, it's not godly. This action that you're doing, what you're saying, how you're acting, it's doesn't line up with the word of God, not in a condemnatory way, but with a challenge that says, come back into alignment, spur one another on, Paul calls it. He says, spur one another on to grow. That doesn't just mean, you know, spur someone to, to make sure they're reading their word. Sometimes it's spur someone to change their attitude. And, and we should have that privilege with one another in the church. And so the end result here is that there's flame out. The love of many will grow cold. I want to give you evidence of this in today's age, and this was within the church that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about hatred in the world. I'm not talking about the increase of hatred in the world. That's in previous verses. What I'm talking about is the, 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 the growing cold and the flaming out of love for God, love for one another, to the point where it's so easy to just flame out, to be non-existent as far as being a flame for Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go into the salvation issue. I don't know how far one can go before they, they uh, give evidence of, of just being enemies with God again. I, I don't know, but I do know this. We need to check our hearts. The Christian Post came out with a poll the poll results were somewhat alarming if you haven't been paying attention. Here they are. The, the poll was taken among those who gave evidence of being born again, and that was by question, of course. Has someone uh, had an encounter with God where they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and asked him to forgive their sins? And that is the definition for them of being born again. I believe being born again is more than that because a lot of people have prayed the prayer, accepted Jesus Christ, asked him to forgive their sins, and continued to live like hell. Pardon me. Live, they look, let's continue years later to live like the devil. Uh, they didn't have a conversion. They really didn't. They weren't born again because they never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They never trusted him for their complete salvation and their life dedicated to him, denying themselves, taking up their cross and following him. So were they truly born again? It's for God to decide, but the evidence is not there that they have been born again. But they used that criteria. And so by and large, this is a, uh, a poll that uh, was administered to people who claim the born again experience and are part of of the church. They are churchgoers, part of the church, at least in their thinking and in the thinking of the pollsters. Okay. I'm not going to make the judgment. Other, I'm going to let the, I'm going to let the poll itself make the judgment. Okay. Here, here it is. 
it was found that 70%, almost 71%, but we'll call it, we'll just, you know, we'll be fair here. Seven out of 10 of those polled, 70% of those polled believe that there is more drum roll, please. Here it is. There is more than one way to get to heaven. In other words, that other religions are valid. Muhammadism, the moon god, the worship of the moon god, that's Islam. Buddhism, uh, some of the million gods of Hinduism, which one is and which one isn't, but evidently 70%, seven out of 10 born again believers, born again believers believe that, in other words, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Will you allow that to sink in? Seven out of 10. If you were to go to a church of 100 people, let's say 100 adults, let's just be fair here, not the children, 100%, 100 adults, Seven out of 10, 70 out of 100 people in the church, adult believers, believe that there is more than one way to get to heaven. Should I turn my mic over and drop it? <laughs> Because of the increase of lawlessness, wickedness, unrighteousness, because of the increase of the attitudes that allow for unrighteousness, the love for God, the love for his word, the love of many, seven out of ten, will grow cold to the point, I'm adding things here, I know, I'm just... I'm connecting the pole to the scripture. The love of seven out of 10 people will grow cold. For that pole to have been taken and show those results says that seven out of 10 people who claim to be believers in Jesus Christ do not have the love for God that would allow, them, and nor do they have the love for the world that would call them to say there is one way and one way only to heaven. And that is a statement of love, by the way. It's not exclusivity. It is a statement of love that God has revealed the way, the one way, not multiple ways. They're all different. They're all different. There's whole th completely different re religious systems can get you to heaven completely opposing views can get you to heaven that makes no sense whatsoever and yet seven out of ten claiming the born again experience have been convinced to believe either be by lack of good teaching or lack of being in the word themselves or absolutely no understanding of the word of god or they really don't know the lord in the first place but one way or the other, the love of many has grown cold, and they don't even have love for the world enough to say, the only way to be saved is through Jesus. You need Jesus Christ. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your sins and turn and have a change of mind about everything and turn and follow Jesus Christ because he is the only way to eternal life. He's the only way to have your sins forgiven. He's the only way to be reconciled to God. Now, you tell me, you tell me we are not living right now, Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. I'm waiting. Ephesians. The Ephesian church, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I believe that, you know, there are many who are um, 
very strict dispensationalists in that they believe that each church represents an age of the church. Each one of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 represents an age of the church, and, and that could be, but I believe every one of the seven are also represented right now. So I don't lean toward that strict dispensationalism so much as to believe that every one of those seven churches are right now a part of the makeup of the church world today. Some are just flat out lawless. Some are in danger of losing even, um, even their candlestick because they're flaming out. And well, here's, here's the church in Ephesus as an example. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. <clears throat> I know your works. I know your toil and your patient endurance and how you, you cannot bear with those who are evil, all right? But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. So this is a church that, you know, is, is standing up against wickedness and standing up against false teachers. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake. And so they're, they're standing strong and you have not grown weary. So there is, um, there is a flame. It is there, but I have this against you. And so now we're entering the danger zone. This is the danger zone for Ephesus, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This would be right now like the church of Ephesus being warned by the Lord because a poll may have been taken, and within the church of Ephesus, seven out of ten people are doubting that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Bingo! They're standing strong against the, the viper. They're standing strong against the lies and the deception of the age. They're standing out saying that the that the, the, the current terrible thing that's happening is manufactured. They're standing up for those things. They're going out and protesting. But they have abandoned their love, the love they had at first, the love for the word, the love for the apostles' teaching, the love for sharing Jesus Christ with the world because he is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. He said it himself, and, and they're sharing that, and, and all of Asia heard the gospel because they shared that way, but now they've backed off. They've slacked off. They've begun to believe the lie. They've begun to believe that, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's because Jesus has delayed in his coming for the church that they've kind of thought, okay, Let's stop watching. Let's stop looking. Let's stop keeping our lives in order because obviously Jesus isn't coming back for his church or he would have come a long time ago. And so therefore, you know, maybe we're just wrong here. Let's just slack off a little bit. Let's be more inclusive. Let's, let's just give people a chance and the whole world will come under grace and there's really not going to be judgment and God wouldn't send anybody to hell. And and oh my goodness, let's just be nice and be kind and and la di da blah 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 blah. Suddenly, because of the increase of lawlessness of the hearts of these people, the love has grown cold. And here you are, right here in Ephesus, right here. Jesus tells them, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. That means turn around and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The anointing will be gone. The presence of Christ will be gone unless you repent. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. <sighs> yet this I have, this, this, but yet this you have, he says, you hate the work of the Nicol Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were those who taught witchcraft and sexual immorality as being godly which I also hate, Jesus said. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat 
the of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god conquer what conquer yourself conquer this flame out of your love that's the text that's the text wow deep stuff matthew chapter 24 deep stuff oh it only applies to israel no it applies to us even now it applies to us even now we're living in it we're seeing we're seeing the separation of a remnant church, a remnant of white hot believers, believers who seek Christ, believers who are looking for Christ, believers who want to be purified from this flesh, believers who have come to the conclusion that there's nothing left on this planet for us. The only ties that we have would be familiar ties, the, the, the love for loved ones who may not be saved, and we continue to work for everyone to be saved. That's the only thing that's holding us here right now. That's the remnant church. But then there's the rest of the church, maybe seven out of 10, who've just given up or they really don't care. It's not even in their, on their horizon that Jesus would come back for the church. They're not being taught. They're not, it's not being preached. It's not a part of who they are. Let's just all get along. Let's just all be tolerant. It's okay to be LGBTQ. D, F, G, W, whatever letter they've attached. I'm not making fun. I'm saying they have become, they have been, become lost in their lack of love for God and the love for the word of God. They have become mired in that. And the love is flaming out. And there is the evidence. A poll taken by the Christian Post. The evidence is there. God help us. God help us. I'm praying for revival in the church. I'm not praying for new conquest in the world. I'm simply saying, Lord, help us to walk through every open door that you give to us so that someone will come to know Jesus Christ. And we are. We are doing that. If you're watching through the Freedom Church Facebook Live page, understand we're doing that with our food distribution ministry and, and, and the 200 meals that were handed out this Monday, and the opportunity to pray with every parent that came through the parking lot. That's all there. It's all being offered. Needs are there, and we're praying for needs with people, and we're introducing Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's an open door. I hope you're doing the very same thing. Find something else. Find, you know, we'll do what we're doing. This is just the door that the Lord has opened for us, but find the door that he's opening for you, and and do your best, because that's all that ties us to the earth right now. Keep your eyes open for Jesus and his appearing. And however long it takes, it might be 10 years. I don't know. I think it could be tomorrow. But that's what I'm expecting. Any day the Lord could come for his church, but I'm going to work like it might be the last day and work until he comes, which could be 20 years down or 30 years down or five days or whatever. What does it matter? Keep your love for Jesus white hot. Lose the cynical attitude. Lose the attitudes of wokeness. Some of you will understand what I'm talking about. Lose the attitude of many ways to be saved. Lose that. Get in your word. Get along with Jesus Christ. Let your flame be relit. And it kind of works from last week, too, with the ten virgins. Ten of them had forgotten the oil to keep their flames hot. Hmm, think there's a connection there? Could be. I do. It's all connected with Jesus. So stay true, stay hot, stay in. If you don't know Jesus, come to Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. We couldn't do it. I mean, we're going to die for our own sins if we don't follow Jesus Christ. You're going to die eternally you're going to be separated from god eternally for your own sins but he died in your place so that your sins are forgiven and all you have to do is believe on him believe in him believe for your entire life for your salvation believe on him he's worth it and follow him you'll be born again you'll be a new creature a love for the word of god will Man, it'll become white hot in you. Get in the word. Get in a church that preaches the word of God. Grow in him. Go through your open door. Tell somebody your story. 
on and on I could go. Father, help us to do this very thing. We'll give you praise and glory, and we say, come quickly. Again, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us into all truth, to lead us into the way, the truth, and the life, to lead us deeper into Jesus Christ in these days, and lead us to be able to tell our story to someone, and we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. All right. Thanks for being here. It was a little shorter this evening, but that's okay. Chew on this stuff for a while. See what happens. <laughs>